Okay, very so, thank you. So, um, I'm Andy. I work for a web performance company in the UK, and I just need to swap hands a minute. Um, and this evening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about HTTP2, and I'm going to talk about what it is, why we need it, what difference it makes in performance terms, and what some things you may come across if you ever decide to deploy it. So I think that's the first place to start is how many of you have actually deployed HTTP2? How many or how many of you have even considered thinking about it? A few. Deployed? Thinking about it? Thinking about it. Okay. So we'll, we'll get on some things you should consider. Um, as has already been said, I'm an early author. Um, oh, the other way around, actually. So, web, page, web performance, the Pocket Guide to Web Performance was the first book I wrote. And that's free if you want to go and download it off my blog. Um, the publisher I published it with has gone bust twice. So, I decided to try and, rather than trying to sell it again, I'd give it away. So, if you want to go get it, it's on andydavis.me slash books. Um, the other one is using web page test, which I wrote with Scomi and Marcel Duran about web page test, surprisingly enough. So, if we're going to talk about HTTP2, or H2 as I would call it, because it's a bit of a tongue twister, first of all, we need to step back in time. And we need to step back in time to 1999, when Google was but a year old. Um, if you worked in IT then, you were probably doing one of two things. You were probably doing this newfangled thing called the internet, which I was getting so excited about. Or you were working for a bank or an insurance company, um, trying to help get to the problems of the year 2000, but we were all really worried about what was going to happen when the year 2000 came along, and whether all our computer systems would just crash. Um, and in 1999 was when, not quite the last standardization, but the, almost the last standardization of HTTP 1.1 took place. Um, the original spec for HTTP 1.1 was written in 1997. It was RFC 2068, for those who really want to know. Um, and it got updated in 2014 with seven separate specs. Um, but, you know, 1999 is a long, long time ago. It's 17, 18, no, 17 years ago. It's a long time ago. And the web has changed tremendously since then. If we look at the web of then, and this is Yahoo, um, as I pulled it from the HTTP archive, it's really simple. It's text. There are a few images on it, but not much. Um, I can't quite remember whether we had CSS then, but most of our font styling was done with a font tag that had size and color. Um, and it was plain, simple text. There's none of the richness which we've got today. And if we move on to today, or to last year, and we look at Yahoo, and we can still see it's Yahoo, we can see the common elements that were there. This, there's still all the news stories, but now they all have pictures with them. We have a menu that's still there, but it's more obvious. We've added adverts in for better or for worse. But the web of today isn't just a document-based web. It's not just the Yahoo style. It's changed. We're doing many, many more things on the web. We're doing, we're building spreadsheets. We're writing text word processors, um, even code editors and code compilers. And then we have things like um, Twitter and Facebook that are trying to do real-time sort of social interactions on the web. And so the web has changed massively since HTTP 1.1 was standardized. And that gives us some challenges. Because HTTP 1.1 doesn't use the web or doesn't use the network very efficiently. Um, underneath HTTP, there's a protocol, protocol called TCP, um, which is the networking stack that gets 
web pages, all the parts of web pages, whether it's images or JavaScript or CSS or HTML, from the server to the client. And originally, that was built to transfer very, very large files reliably over long distances. But that's not the way the web is built. The web is made up of many, many small, in the case of images, getting bigger assets that we generally don't want to tra transmit as far. We're quite close to our websites. We get things like duplication of HTTP headers. Um, we get something called the slow start mechanism, which where we'll come on to, where um, TCP connections are built to determine how what the data rate they can support over their connection is. So TCP adjusts and it's built for large downloads, and that's not what the web is. So what we've been doing, perhaps without realizing it, is we've been hacking around some of the limitations of HTTP 1.1, hacking around some of the limitations of TCP. And the first of those is that every TCP connection only supports one request at a time. When you do a, a GET request to get HTML or the CSS that comes with it, that's using that TCP connection. Until that request, until you get a response back for that request, that TCP connection can't be used for anything else. It's known as head of line blocking. Um, we did try using HTTP pipelining. So you could send multiple requests and allow the server to use the connection appropriately. But that doesn't work in practice. Proxies on the web break it. So what changed is browsers allowed us to make more than one request in parallel. The original RFC says you can make two requests. And if you test anything in IE6, um, it's worth looking at every now and again. You can actually see it still conforms to the standard. It only allows you to make two parallel requests together. But Firefox discovered that if you changed its number, if you took the should and ignored the should in language in the spec and changed it to four requests in parallel, they discovered you could download pages quick, more quickly. So eventually, we got to a situation where um, Chrome today makes six parallel requests to a host, um, IE will go up to 11, depending on the quality of the network. So what's happened is our browsers have given us a way to make more downloads in parallel, which speeds up the page. But that wasn't good enough for us. That wasn't good enough for us developers. So what we did is we decided we'd split where we host our content over multiple host names. So no, we go from a situation where we can only make six requests to a single host name to where if we split our content over two hosts, suddenly we can make 12 parallel requests. Or in the case of the BBC here, where they split it over four host names, we can make 24 parallel requests. So that's 24 TCP connections that are being set up, going through something called the slow start process, um, and trying to send us packets. And there's a challenge with that, because what happens is there's a reason TCP has a congestion control algorithm. There's a reason it has something called slow start. And that's, it's trying to determine what's, how, what the throughput it can have on the network. And when we do things like use more connections, split over more uh, hosts, we're working around that. We're circumventing it. And network routers, for example, home uh, broadband routers with the connect to DSL and have Wi-Fi, they all have limited amounts of memory. And what happens is when they get too busy or they get too full, they drop packets. They throw them away. Um, and that's your data that's being thrown away. So what happens is the connection has to say, I didn't get this. Can you resend it? So we get packet loss. And eventually, we, lead to, we can lead to a situation where we're doing ourselves more harm than we're doing ourselves good. A um, guy named William Chan, when he was in the Chrome team, uh, wrote a study looking at Etsy um, and looking at how Etsy split their images over four different hosts. And what he could see in the, the tests he did, he could see where packets were getting lost, so the where splitting over four different hosts was actually harming Etsy's performance rather than making it better. Once we get out of 
packet loss territory, we have to acknowledge that every request we make over the network has an overhead. Every time we do a GET request for an image or a script, it has an overhead. And the first of those overheads is the round trip time. It is the latency, it's the time the request takes to get from our browser to the server we're talking to and come back to us. And because the response is split up into a number of packets, each of those is bound by latency as well. And as Mike, this chart from Mike Belshi shows uh, when he was at Google, you know, as latency goes up, as the round trip time between us and our server goes up, then so our page load times go down. The other overhead we have for every request is that we send headers with every request. We send the user agent with every request. We send the cookies with every request. And when you look at a page that's loading, you find that somewhere around 60% of the header bytes are the same for every request you make for that page. So there's a huge amount of duplication that's going on and a huge amount of wastage. Um, we had a client in the UK, um, a large retailer, and they were sending 5K cookies with every request. Um, and what they discovered is, is that duplication and the overhead of sending those cookies was actually the limiting factor in making their pages load faster. So we often don't think about the headers we send when we do a GET request, but it makes a massive diff can make a massive difference to the performance of our page. Um, the other thing is when we have really, really small responses is we may not use something called the congestion window. So, a um, bit of networking theory. I know I'm in a JavaScript meetup, but forgive me. Um, so when you make a request, get request to a web page, we don't get the whole response. We may not get the whole response back. What we do is we get a number of packets back. Um, commonly now, it's about 10 packets. It's what's known as the congestion window. Um, and for each packet we get back, we our browser acknowledges to the server that it got it, and it grows the window, so it can send more in the next round trip. But that means if we've got a congestion window of 10, it means roughly every time we make a new request on a new TCP connection, that server can send us 15K. Now, if we've got you know, files that are 1K, 2K, 3K, um, in this case, 4.5K, what that means is the server's only sending us 4.5K, it could have sent us 15. And we, we're wasting that available bandwidth to us. So what do we do about this? Well, typically, is we follow recipes. We read Smashing Mag or read Steve Souder's book, and we they have these recipes like compress stuff, concatenate stuff, join it together, make image sprites. You know, and we follow those because we're told they make our websites faster. But they come with their own penalties. They come with their own costs. And while they may seemingly magically make our sites faster, what we're essentially doing is working around some of the problems of the network. So you know, one of the common things we do is we create bundles of JavaScript. We merge our separate JavaScript files into a single bundle. Or we merge all our JavaScript. Sorry, we merge, or we merge our CSS files into a single bundle and download them once. And what that means is we actually have more for the browsers to download and parse. Because it may not have needed all that content, but it's got to download it anyway, because we as developers have decided it has to download it. The other challenge is when we change it, it becomes invalid. You know, the browser has to download it all again. The, doesn't matter if it's got it in cache, the version it's got in cache is no longer valid. So it has to throw it away and re-download it. The other thing we do is we get all the little images for icons and we make sprites of them. Um, in this case, this is a nice regular sprite because I created it. Um, if you look at some sites, you'll see um, they've often got their logo, some other images on a big transparent background. And the challenge is to get one image 
out of the sprite, you have to download the whole sprite. And you have to decode. Oops, not in there. Yes, so you have to download and decode the whole image. And so we're downloading more than we need, but it's also a challenge on mobile phones, where mobile phones are really, really short on memory. And um, we think of browsers as having a cache on disk, where files that get downloaded get stored. But browsers also have caches in memory. Um, so typically, what a browser will try to do in a sprite terms is they'll download it and try and keep the image in memory for as long as possible. But when they get under memory pressure, they throw it away. Now, if we use this dollar sprite here at the top of the page, and then we start to scroll down the page, the browser needs that memory. It throws the sprite away, and then it discovers further on down it needed another image out of that sprite. So what it has to do is go back to the disk cache, uncomp decode the image again, and extract the image it wanted. So, you know, it's, it, using sprites is not without costs, particularly on mobile phones. Um, the last thing we tend to do is we override the browser's priorities. Um, over the last 20 odd years of building browsers, browser makers have begun to understand or have a good understanding of the dependencies we build in web pages. They know um, where we need CSS and JavaScript and how important they are to getting our pages to render quickly. So what they choose to do is set priorities on the order they download assets. Um, typically, the HTML has the highest priority with CSS after that. Um, then in virtually all the modern browsers, so in Chrome, i.e. Firefox, I can't quite remember about Safari, it will go and download the JavaScript next, regardless of whether you've put the JavaScript at the bottom the browser will go and find the JavaScript and download it next, because that's what they've discovered looking at their masses of data they need to go and do. So what happens is sometimes we embed binary data with data URIs. This is an image. Um, we often come across fonts embedded as data URIs because it makes the page seemingly render quicker. But what we're doing is we're, say, making our CSS larger to download because we embedded a binary blob in it. Um, or where we embed images in our CSS using this, you end up with a situation where the browser would have delayed downloading the image. But as a developer, you're saying, no, I want you to treat this image as a high priority. And generally, browsers know best. Um, there's also the challenge of managing data URIs. I was looking at a customer site before Christmas. And they had 26 data URIs in their CSS of which three were their logo. Um, there's some others which were duplicated or repeated. And, you know, we don't, this is gobbledygook to us. We can't, we can look at an image and determine what it is. We can't look at base 64 encoding and decide, oh, that's my logo. So we get into messes with it. The other thing we do is we inline critical resources. Um, you know, we know that we need JavaScript to render the page. So we decide what's the most important JavaScript we need to render the page and bang it straight into our HTML document, um, which leaves us with challenges of how do we manage that. And what all these sorts of things point out is there's a tension between the best way to modularize our site, to build it, to build it from a component-based um, point of view. How do we split up our CSS, how do we split up our JavaScript, so it makes it easy to develop, and the most efficient way to deliver it over the network. Um, and we've been using build tools such as Gulp, Grunt, Make even, Plumber, Broccoli, whatever your latest favorite is, um, and services like uh, Google PageSpeed, Akamai's Ion, things like that, to overcome that gap to allow us to try and develop in a way that's easy for us, that fits our development processes, but still allows us to deliver reasonably efficiently. But what if we could use the network more efficiently from a native point of view? What if the network was more efficient out of the box? And that's where HTTP2 
comes in. That's what HTTP2 is trying to do. And typically when somebody um, gives a H2 demo, the first thing they do is they give you a comparison. They give you a comparison film strip, and this one was produced with web page test. And they compare HTTP 1.1 with HTTP 2. And this is the um, Go for tiles test that the Golang people built. Um, and as we can see, the HTTP H2 one's finished. Um, the HTTP 1. <coughs> excuse me, the HTTP 1.1 one goes on for a bit longer. So, you know, the H2 one finished in 1.3 seconds. The other one took 3.6. But it's impressive. But is it a real-world test? And whenever anybody shows you a benchmark, always think about how or whether it's a real-world test and what are the assumptions they're making or what are the conclusions they're trying to draw. Because if you remember in the beginning, I, or partway through, I talked about how, HTTP, how TCP was really bad at downloading small files. And what we have here is an example where the image is made up of many, many small files. So it's always going to penalize HTTP 1.1 because it's built to be inefficient for HTTP 1. Whereas it's, the small files don't penalize HTTP 2. So H2 is more efficient, so it's faster. So it's not a real world test, I'd suggest. It's, it's interesting. And Akamai and Key CDN built similar things. It's interesting, but the real world is messier than that. So H2. Um, things to remember is, if you remember nothing else, it behaves like HTTP 1.1 at a protocol level. You've still got the normal methods like get, post, delete, put. Um, status codes remain the same. 200s, 300s, 400s, 500s. Uh, where it's different is HTTP 1.1 is a text-based protocol. All the headers, all the data that gets sent back and forth across the wire is in plain text. You can tell that into your web server, <coughs> and you can see the plain text with a HTTP 1.1 server. Uh, with H2, it's binary. It uses a fixed length binary frame to make things more efficient to process. Um, it uses header compression to get rid of all that duplication of user agent across all the requests for a page. It uses header compression to reduce that duplication. Uh, it's multiplex that we'll come on to. And unlike HTTP 1.1, the server can decide to send the browser a resource before the browser needs it. At the moment, HTTP 1.1 is a pull model. So the server doesn't do anything until the browser asks it for something. So we re browser requests a web page, downloads the HTML, starts parsing the HTML, discovers the other things it needs, like the CSS, and then requests them from the web server. In H2, the server may already know that, and it can decide to push resources, and we'll come on to that. So uh, this is a waterfall from uh, web page test, I believe, but it looks pretty much like a typical waterfall we see in our browser dev tools right now. Each row is a request. And instead of being split over separate TCP connections, if we're making the request to our own server, they all use the same TCP connection. In H2 terms, they become a stream. So each resource download is a stream. Um, <coughs> And streams get split into frames. And here we've got an example where the headers for the request or the response are in a headers frame. And then, depending on how the big the body is, we'll have one or more data frames. There are other frames available. So there's a frame for push. There's a frame for um, telling the other end of the connection to go away. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, there are ones to change the settings or just check whether the other end is still responding. But it's the idea that in H2, everything is split into a fixed length frame. And then those frames intermingle together or are multiplexed across a single TCP connection. And in this example, you can see 
Um, we've got a browser on the left and a server on the right. And the headers for stream one have already gone past, but we've got a frame for stream one's data. Then we've got the headers for stream two, data for stream two, and then some data for stream one again. And we've got some data for stream four going back the other way. But we've now got a single TCP connection where our requests for all the resources on our page that come from the same server are mixed together. And it sort of looks like this. So this is a bottom of the web page test waterfall where it shows TCP connection use. This is the same site tested on H2 and H1.1. And you can see on the top one, we have a single connection. And on the bottom, we have six. The gaps right at the end of the waterfall are images that have been loaded using JavaScript. So that's why they've got funny timing. But this is very much the difference at a wire level between um, the two protocols. So our challenge becomes, if we have a single connection and we want to multiplex our data along it, in it, how do we decide on our priority? How do we decide which packets go first? Or how do we control which packets go first and which ones go later? Um, and H2 has a mechanism for uh, prioritization and dependencies. And in this situation, we've got, um, so the, the dotted circle is, is the root object. Uh, and then we've got, I'm going to stand over here, actually. Um, we've got a, a resource that's got an ID of 2 and a weight of 200. Um, and then another one's got a weight of 100, and another one's got a weight of 1. And what this means is essentially this will get 2 thirds of the bandwidth, or 2 thirds of the frames. This will get one third of the frames, and this will get practically none. Um, as I've put there. And then when the resource with the ID of two finishes, its two thirds get split between uh, resources with ID eight and, and ten. So if ID four is still going, then the two in the bottom left will get a third of the bandwidth each and ID4 will get a third of the bandwidth. And so it allows us to build a tree structure that says, this is how much I want you to allocate to each of these frames, and these are the other frames that depend on them. So when their parent frames finish, they can have their resources. That's the theory. Uh, in reality, it's really, really hard to implement. Um, Chrome doesn't implement this yet, or as of February when I spoke to them about it, they didn't implement it yet because it's hard and nobody's quite worked it out. So that's what the spec says. There are very few people following the spec here. But even when we've got those dependencies working, it becomes what's the optimal order of downloading the resources on our page? Does it remain the same throughout the page load? So if you take, for example, HTML page with its head section where we've typically got our CSS. Um, hopefully no JavaScript, but reality most web pages have JavaScript in the head. And then we get down into the body, which is the content our visitors actually see. I, as a browser, I can't render the body until I've got all the CSS. I can't render the body until I've built something called the CSS object model. So does it become the point that the head of the HTML document gets the priority. And then as soon as the browser starts to discover that it needs the CSS, the CSS should get the priority until it's got it all. And so the rest of the frames for the document get deprioritized. There are all sorts of interesting questions around this that are still being explored um, and we still have to discover. And we don't know the optimal order yet. We can guess at it, but it will still be working out. Um, Header compression we've talked about. Um, there is a spec called HPAC that deals with header compression. Uh, it's basically a lookup table for common headers, and you can add other headers in it. Um, most of us will never touch it, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. But I suppose the real question is, does it actually make any difference in the real world? And um, for what I did for this test example is I got some 
dodgy template off some uh, template site uh, for a page that has about 36 resources. So it's probably a bit light in terms of resources and probably a bit small in terms of download size. And I hosted it in Ireland and I tested it using web page test in Singapore. So I tested it over a long latency um, connection. And if we play it, and this is running at a back quarter speed. You know, we can see that the HT1 started rendering first and got there first and is, is you know, clearly ahead of uh, the H1 one. It, you know, the HT1 is finished, the H1 has still got to load its hero image. Um, and if we play it on, we'll see it catches up. And eventually it gets there two seconds later. So in this example, it's you know made a significant difference. It's made the whole page load two seconds faster. But if you think back 15 minutes, I said, if anybody ever shows you an example that proves their case, question them about it. Question, what have they not told you? Or what have they done in their test case that doesn't represent your real world? And you know, how many of us are hosting a web page in Dublin or a web page in Athens, serving customers in Singapore or LA? Lots of our customers end up being local. Lots of our customers end up on short round trip time. So I did another experiment. I used the same host in Dublin and I tested it from Dublin. So over a really, really short round trip time over a really, really fast connection. And what we can see is that over a really, really fast connection, HB 1.1 is slightly ahead. These frames are every tenth of a second. Um, we can say, see, it's the interesting one is it's drawn, it's drawn three frames here, and it's drawn three frames here. Whereas the one underneath has actually got all six frames, so it's it's slightly ahead, but not too far ahead. And that's because HTTP2 generally the browsers will only support it over a TLS connection, will only support it over a secure connection. So we have the cost of setting up that secure connection, which is our penalty here. And then when we run on to the end, we find H2 sort of renders a bit quicker, sort of finishes the page a bit quicker than HTTP 1.1. So what, what we can discover from those tests is that over a long distance, H2 is better. Over a short distance, in this case, it's roughly neck and neck, but we also get the advantage of having a secure connection set up. So our visitors have privacy um, and all the other things that come with HTTPS. So that was my test examples. Um, fortunately, the Financial Times in London have actually been deploying H2 in, in production in live serving just their images to their customers over H2. So they have some real world data as well, which is really, really helpful. Um, so this is the, the FT's um, real world data, and this is their 95th percentile load time. And we can see right across the piece, whether it's mobile and tablet or desktop, H2 gives their users their visitors a faster experience. It's less noticeable on the desktop, it's less clear, um, and that might be because overall desktop users have better connections, have faster machines, don't have to deal with the mobile latencies that mobile users do. Um, they reinforce the point with the latency that as latency increases, then, you know, HP2 gives their visitors a better experience. So in the places where latency is low, there's not so much of a noticeable experience. Although right down the bottom, it's zero latency, which is quite interesting. 
HD is faster, and that's a bit bizarre. Um, and the other thing is they started looking at when the pages drew and how fast they drew. And again, right across the piece, the pages start to draw quicker. So it's clear that H2 for my tests, for the FT's real world data, and for some other people doing it, delivers real world performance improvements. It's um, the rule of thumb based on, not the rule of thumb, but um, based on data we've seen from a number of people, it can make things anywhere from 5% worse to 20% better. And that's without doing any optimizations for H2. That's just taking their existing site and converting it over. But H2 gives us the opportunities for new types of optimizations, optimizations we haven't been able to do before. And the first of those is server push. So as I mentioned earlier, our browser downloads the HTML page. Until it's got that HTML, it knows nothing about the other resources it's going to download. It doesn't know what CSS it needs, doesn't know what JavaScript it needs, knows nothing. It's blind. And what we can do instead is when our server is building the page, our server will already know that when somebody requests this page, they normally request this CSS file to go with it or this JavaScript file to go with it. So we can have the option to push those CSS files or those JavaScript files to the browser before they even know they use them. In some cases, before they've even started to get the HTML response back. So we can send it to them ahead of time. Um, and then when the page is built, the page gets sent down to the browser and the browser can start to assemble it and start to draw it. Um, there are some challenges with push in that, in theory, a browser can reject a push. It can say, I already have this in cache. I don't need this. Uh, the reality is those bytes are already on the wire and already on the way to the browser. There are some, there is some work around looking at ways of hinting to the server as to what the browser already has in its cache. Um, but that's very experimental at the moment. And we've got other opportunities for server push. Um, if we host our fonts ourselves or our background images, font, let's take the example of fonts. Um, although the browser can build the DOM and build a CSS object model from the CSS and then put them together to make a render tree, which is where it works out how to lay out the page and the size of things, it's only at the point it lays out the render tree, it begins to understand the fonts you've used in your CSS are actually used. That's the point it discovers it actually needs to download the fonts. So if we host the fonts ourselves, we can push the fonts to the browser. It might only save a couple milliseconds, but it gives our visitors a faster experience. Um, the way we can interleave frames can help us deliver better experiences. So John Meller at Google, um, about three years ago now, I think, did this experiment where he looked at uh, how much of the images on a page, how much of their bytes did you actually need to make a usable experience, to make an experience that worked for the um, browser, also worked for Vista. So uh, on one side we have, on the left, we have the equivalent of HTTP 1.1. On the right, we have the equivalent of H2. And at, you know, at 5% even, we can see that H2 you know, is already there's more there. Then with just 15% of the bytes, the H2 page is almost usable, and the H1 is far behind. And what we find is that the H1, uh, 25%, H2 is almost complete. You could use that page. You wouldn't be aware there's much missing. And the H1 one takes almost 80% of the image bytes to deliver the equivalent of experience. There are some questions over um, progressive JPEGs, but th the study was very small. But you know, for me, this works. So if we're going to move to HP 1.1, HP 2, when do we kill off some of our H1 optimization techniques? When, is our, when are our browsers and our servers and our visitors' browsers ready to support this? Well, the good news is with the exception of i.e., because Edge is still a beta browser, all the mainstream browsers already support HTTP2. So 50% of most people's browser base, at least, um, we've got some customers where it's 
have a browser that's capable of supporting HTTP2. Um, servers are pretty good. Uh, there was a time when I worried about Apache and Nginx, but they've sorted it over the last year. So all the common servers support HTTP2. Some of them don't support it completely, so some of them don't support server push yet. Um, but it's, it's widely supported, so you can deploy it today. Um, the key thing is to you pick your server carefully and test them, as we'll come on to. So um, does it respect any dependencies that are set to it? I had a test a few years ago when Apache, I was using Speedy, and Chrome went from a position of um, sending, uh, enforcing priorities itself to sending them to Apache to enforce, and Apache didn't enforce the priorities, and my page went from being 20% quicker to 20% slower, which is a bit embarrassing as I was about to give a talk on it. Um, does it support server push? How does it help with optimization? Can it do the stuff that, look, this person downloads HTML, the other people who download this HTML have this CSS, can, they down, can I push it to them too? So there are, there are all sorts of optimization it can do. When you deploy it, you're going to find some strange things. Um, because we use a single long TCP connection instead of six to our server, uh, because it's lots of new code, you'll find some strange things. This is what I found. Um, this is fixed now, but um, I pushed seven resources from a test page for the CSS and the JavaScript. And if you look at the blue lines for the JavaScript and the font, you'll find this JavaScript and the font have been, has been sent to the client before the CSS was, which is not what I intended at all. Um, fortunately, they fixed it. Um, Khan Academy came up with this one, where they have 256 JavaScript files on the same page. Um, and they had some real, real problems. And, but part of it is they track down to the fact that uh, GFE, which is Google's web server, wasn't being great at having 250 odd requests thrown at it and then trying to work out which one am I going to send first and having to prioritize them all. And Chrome as a browser and the other browsers you know, aren't quite yet used to the idea that, oh, I'm just going to request everything for this page instead of having them in a prioritized queue so they dribble out requests. Uh, sometimes browsers have unexpected behaviors. I was doing a test um, for server push against no server push. And in Chrome 46, without server push, it was really, really slow. It was, was slower. But in Firefox, it didn't make any difference um, until I talked to the Chrome team and discovered that there was actually a third of a second gap where Chrome was basically deciding, what am I going to do? Um, and server push sort of hit that. There's also some challenges that have happened last week where Chrome have deprecated something called NPN. So um, as part of some extensions to TLS, we can now, as a browser, we can say, I want you to upgrade the protocol. Or the server can say to the client, I want you to upgrade the protocol. Um, and NPN was the way we did it. ALPN yeah, is the way we do it now. Um, so Chrome deprecated the old one. Unfortunately, most of the open SSL libs that are deployed on um, Linux distributions don't support ALPN next. So people who've been deploying H2 that way have found their visitors have fallen back. Um, if you want a great read of some of the challenges, um, this Dropbox blog post where they enabled H2 on their Canary servers, they saw their inbound bandwidth consumption go down by 50% mainly due to header compression, but they saw all their post requests take longer, and they tracked it down to a bug in Nginx, but it, it all shows that how there are benefits there to be had, but our software and our infrastructure isn't quite yet mature enough to take advantage of them. So some tools that might help you understand if you decide to deploy this and come across some strange things you don't quite get. Um, if you really want, really want to get down and then dirty in the network, Wireshark is Wireshark. If you save the TLS keys, you can decode the packet trace, decode the TLS, and you can actually see what's happening, happening on the wire. Um, I don't do this very often. Um, the thing I probably use the most is Chrome's net internals, where 
you can pick a H2 stream up, you can see it's set up, you can see the get requests, you can see the push promises. Uh, Rebecca Murphy wrote a utility where if you copy and paste this into a text file and then run it through, you can um, plot a chart that shows the different H2 frames on the wire as they're being downloaded. And I use this because it's quite handy. And then web page test is the other thing that's um, really handy because it will show you server pushes. You can see the waterfall. You can test as you would test the HTTP 1.1 site and get more information. So some of our customers are H2 capable. Some of them aren't. How do we balance their need? How do we cope with the change from HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2? And the good news is some of the practices we've got already still remain good practices. So things like making our downloads smaller so they make so there's less round trips involved. So GZIP compression or Brotly compression um, in newer servers, shrinking images via optimizing them, minifying CSS or JavaScript to make it smaller are all good practices. Reducing redirects. Um, using effective caching so our browser never has to go out to the network to find something. Uh, using CDNs to reduce latency or um, reducing DNS lookups or the number of TCP connections we use overall are still good practices and will remain good practices. Others, the jury is out on a bit. Um, the theory says replace inlining, so where we take our, our CSS and just slap it in the head of our HTML, we should replace that with server push. Some people see success with that at the moment, some people don't. Um, reducing CSS and JS, JS concatenation, yes. Image spriting is an interesting example. Um, where people are still using bitmapped images, so YouTube have got this with their ping icons, for example. So the problem they had with reduced getting rid of all their sprites is you have an icon on a screen, and then if it's got a rollover state when you want to roll over it, when you had a sprite, all the images you needed were there. But when they're separate, the browser then has to go to the network and download it. So they had some problems with delays there. Um, I'd say use SVG and style it with CSS, but if you've got to use sprites, keep the icon and its rollover pair together. Um, and generally, we, for a long time, we've been encouraged, discouraging people from using shards to only splitting content over two host names because of the issues involved with it. And H2 can help us there, where if we have two hosts, say www.bbc.co.uk and images.bbc.co.uk, and they actually resolve to the same server with the same IP address, um, they have the same certificate protecting them, then what H2 will do, instead of having two connections, it will coalesce them. It will combine them and use a single connection with the frame split out over it. And although um, there are two lines on this chart, you can see in the second one, although the DNS lookup has been done to get its IP address, um, there's actually no new TCP connection made. It's used the existing one. Um, efficient TLS. So, you can own, there is H2 in the clear for server-to-server -server communications. No browser supports it. If you're serving H2 to your visitors, you need to use TLS. And being efficient about TLS is important. So using um, certificate stapling, session resumption, uh, when TLS 1.3 comes along and will remove some more round trips from a, making a secure connection, that will help too. Uh, if you want to learn about TLS, this is the place to go. So Ilya wrote, runs his TLS fast yet. Ivan's book is probably the best book you will ever find on HTTPS. Um, and Ivan was involved with SSL Labs. If you ever set up a server that's got HTTPS on it, test it against SSL Labs, because it will find any issues you've got. But we've still got plenty of challenges. Um, we've still got things like ES6 modules, which we're not quite sure how going to work. We've still got how do we divide traffic and serve the appropriate things to our visitors that are on HTTP 1.1. You know, if we optimize for HTTP 2, do we degrade our HTTP 1.1 experience? Does that matter? Um, and there are some ideas around that. 
The other challenge we've got is just the number of third parties people include in our web page. Um, if you look at a typical retail site in the UK uh, and the US and France and Germany, and I haven't checked for Greece, but I'm assuming it's not that much different. It contains tags from A-B testing frameworks like Optimizely or Maximizer. It contains things for ad networks, analytics networks. And increasingly, we're adding more and more of other people's stuff to our website. And we have no control over that. Um, and H2 doesn't help us here because H2 only controls the connection to our server or to their server. And these third parties typically download off several hosts, very small files, and H2 doesn't really help us with their performance. But there are some things that can help us there. Um, so there's something called the W3C res resource hint spec. Uh, Chrome certainly implements all of these. The other browsers implement them to a more or lesser extent. So we can avoid our browser having to discover we need to go to the Google fonts, because if we use a Google font in our page, we download the Google CSS, and then the fonts come from a separate host. So the browser has to do a DNS lookup for it. So we can do things like hint to the browser to say, no, don't wait until you discover I'm going to use, or my page uses this domain. Go resolve its DNS now. Go look up its name and get its IP address. Um, there's the same, you can go one step further, you can say, OK, don't just resolve its IP address. Make a TCP connection to it. I know I'm going to use that TCP connection. You may not yet, but go make that TCP connection. And it works around the, the delay of the browser discovering it. And then finally, there's one called preload, where what it actually says to the browser is, look, you may not know I need this file, but I know I need this file. Go and download it. And it will download it as a priority. So those help us tame our third parties. Um, if you want to learn more about HTTP2, uh, there was a chapter from Ilya's book released by O'Reilly uh, for free. The whole book is free online anyway, so you can go read High Performance Browser Networking for free. Um, and Daniel Steinberg of Mozilla wrote HTTP2 Explained, which is another good read. Um, so go find them, read them if you want to deploy. But the thing I'd encourage you to do is you're thinking about using HP2 is go download it, go explore. Uh, we deployed HP 1.1 in 1997 originally. Steve Sadders' first book about how do you optimize it came out in 2006 or 2007. So it took us 10 years to discover how to make the most of that protocol. And we don't really, and our users don't want to wait 10 years for us to discover to make the best of this protocol. So go use it, go play with it, go learn, and share what you've learned, because we can all benefit from that, because everybody deserves a great web experience. Thank you. <laughs> That's me on Twitter. That's my work email address, and I will. The slides aren't there yet because I've got to go edit the videos to make them make sense. But I will upload the slides by the end of the week. But at that point, it's are there any questions? Thank you very much, Andy. What about that, huh? So, questions? Okay. Hello, my name is George. Are there any good advice about how do you make the transition from H1.1 to H2? Because uh, if uh, H2 uses a stream, how, in, if you have multiple CDNs, how do you use the multiple CDNs in H2? Because again, you have to open multiple TCP connections. So you have to guess what the user uses, H1 or H2. and. Uh, Change your website, for example, if you, the user have H1.1, you will have to have multiple resources, multiple CDNs to load faster, but it needs to, to minimize them to, to three, I don't know which is the hmm. best number. Okay, so the, the, if I read the question rightly, it's how do you manage delivering to both HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2 clients? efficiently, and how do you 
control the transition. Um, the, so the, the, the browser will tell the server whether it supports H2 and if it supports H2 and the server supports H2, then the browser will automatically upgrade to H2. Um, so that means we go from a situation of using multiple TCP connections to one connection automatically. The then becomes the challenge is how do you optimize those um, the resources so they're delivered efficient in the most efficient way depending on what protocol somebody's using. Um, and there's the easiest way of doing that at the moment is to hand it off to somebody like Akamai who will do it with their Ion product who will optimize your site differently depending on what protocol people are using, what devices people are using, et cetera. But you know, that's not um, something we can all do. You know, we all can't afford massive Akamai bills to go and make things faster. So what some people are doing is they're slowly moving to a H2 based, um, what's optimal for H2 based on their visitor numbers, based on what their bra the visitors the browsers have got. So as the population of people who can support H2 increases, they are deploying more and more H2 optimizations and getting rid of some of the H1 ones. It's, it's, like, it's like any feature you put on a website that relies on something technical. You, you, you're guided by the devices and the browsers your visitors are using and use that as your transition. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, hello, and uh, thanks for the excellent presentation, first of all. Um, well, I got a question that's not really technical, but uh, in a nutshell, how optimistic are you about the chances of HTTP really improving the web as a platform? And let me explain you my, uh, let me explain my line of thinking here. In the example that you gave, uh, the Singapore to Ireland example, we gained like about two seconds or something, right? So I'm sure that, uh, you know, designers and developers being really creative, we're going to find new ways to bloat our pages and put new stuff in. And it's not going to make, I'm not a pessimist would argue that it's not going to make any difference. We're just going to find new ways to bloat our pages. And it's, it's probably mainly not a, well, my assumption, my, my opinion on this, uh, to be more precise, that it's not so much a technology problem, it's a design and maybe even culture problem, because we only think of performance as an afterthought when it's too late and we just try to patch things up instead of building something from the ground up with performance as a feature. So I don't, uh, how do you feel about this? Do you mm -hmm. think confident that's going to be? I think, I think that's a very fair summary. It's, it's the old situation where we have traffic jams, so we build bigger roads and we have bigger traffic jams, so we fill capacity. So um, making the web faster will certainly benefit those people who um, are careful about how they build their pages. And it's, it's, it's about how businesses and site owners and product owners and people who build the web view performance is, is the fundamental root of it. And what we see, and we deal with banks, insurance companies, um, large online retailers in the UK, and there's a whole spectrum of people. There's the people who really don't think of performance, they're completely unaware, um, right through to the people who are measuring performance in, for, in their visitors' browsers in production, and as well as measuring the performance or their visitors' experience, they also do things like have customer satisfaction surveys that are done independently, and they can actually track that when the pages get slower, their customer satisfaction goes down. And that becomes then, um, makes them think about it across the whole organization. So the CEO, and they are selling a billion pounds worth of stuff online a year, so they're, they're a big retailer. The, the CEO now pays attention to the performance numbers, and they, they talk about it in public. Um, so it's Marks and Spencers is the retailer in this case. They talk about it in public. So other retailers become aware of it. And we are seeing a shift, certainly amongst retailers, where it's easy to quantify the benefit of performance, where they're, they're starting to think about how do we build performance in the beginning? How do we design it in rather than add it in as an after effect? Because adding it in as an after effect is like the whole thing. It's like the same thing of, you know, the later you find a bug, 
in your release cycle, the more it costs you. The earlier you can add performance in, the earlier you can think about it and design for it, the earlier you get it. And it is, it's a cultural problem, an organizational problem. And some organizations are better at solving it than others. Some are more mature. But I'm optimistic it'll get solved. Or they'll go bust. Any other questions? Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, so the first quick question is, uh, you saw many diagrams about the speed that you gain from moving to HTTP2, mm -hmm. but are there any benefits on the server side? Because I believe there's big performance gain on having less connections to the server. And the other quick question is, uh, so you, you, you said that I can have different domains Mm -hmm. but I can connect using one HTTP2 connection. Mm -hmm. Is there an optimization where I have multiple A records, for example, and the browser chooses the one that already has a connection to? So, for example, I have three servers as my uh, load balancers. Mm -hmm. Does the, the, the web server choose the, the one that has already a connection to through another domain? So. Um, to answer the first one, the last one first, um, it depends how the, so it depends how the DNS resolver works. So it's, if you've got multiple A records, it's pretty much potluck as to what will resolve second time. It, um, so what, and even if you use global load balancing, there can be a challenge that even though for parts of the world in theory, you will resolve to the same IP address, it doesn't always happen um, because of the way people do global load balancing and the factors they use to choose where they're routing. So it works on a small basis. There are some challenges with it on the other. And this is where I go, can you repeat your first question again? Because I've got on it. Yeah. Uh, so on the server oh, the, side. Yes, yes, yeah. OK, I'm with you. Yeah. So um, one of the French load testing companies, um, I can't remember if it was Neotis or Load Impact, did a study where they, they looked at the server impact of um, HTTP2 and came to the conclusion it had a lower server load from managing the TCP connection point of view. The, the challenge we've got and the, challenge, the piece we're missing at the moment is at a, at a firewall level, you've gone from having a, a lot of TCP connections that are relatively short-lived to one t fewer TCP connections that are live for much longer. And, and I suspect there are some issues with some low balance and some firewalls around that, and we just haven't discovered them yet. 